chromosome. Now you're back to having exactly the ends that you had at the beginning. And so by removing the primer from the left end and by extending the right end with this novel RNA protein enzyme, the replication problem is solved. We decided to try to extend the number of different telomerases that were known, because often comparison between telomerases from, or between any biochemical component from one species to another, can be very informative about uh, the function of various portions of the molecule. This turned out to be a very difficult procedure, because the telomerase RNA subunit has a completely different sequence when you go from organism to organism, or almost completely different. The only portion of it that we could count on having a particular sequence was the template region. So, so the um, tetrahymena telomerase had been found by Blackburn and Greider. We're trying to find the telomerase RNA from Oxytrica or from, and from uh, Euplodes, and the one portion that we could count on was that it would have uh, a template region within the gene encoding for the telomerase RNA that would have C's and A's because they would have to template the addition of the G4-T4 strand at the end of the chromosome. So we, were, we thought that that was a, a very reasonable expectation. There was no other part of the telomerase RNA itself that we felt that we could predict the sequence of. However, right to the left or upstream of the start of the gene, there has to be some kind of a block of nucleotides in the DNA that tell RNA polymerase to sit down there and make RNA in the direction shown by the arrow. That's called a promoter sequence. And based on the sequences of other pr promoters in ciliated protozoa, we're able to make a guess as to what that promoter sequence would be. We then used a very powerful technology that's only uh, been available for the last few years called the polymerase chain reaction. And it enables one in a, a test tube outside of a living organism to go from one copy of a nucleic acid to two, to four, to eight, to 16. And before long, you have a whole test tube crowded with molecules that were all copied from one original molecule, even if that original molecule was a single gene in a mixture of uh, many thousands or hundred thousand other genes. How does this work? Well, just to describe it briefly, you make a short synthetic piece of DNA by chemical synthesis that can pair with the yellow region, and then you add an enzyme that extends that, you, you pair that short synthetic piece with one strand of the gene and you extend it in the direction to the left. Now you make another uh, synthetic DNA that can pair with, the, uh, with that strand that you've just made uh, using the information about the promoter sequence. And then you extend that to the right and it goes back and forth extending to the left and to the right. The information to, uh, outside, to the left of the red block and to the right of the yellow block is lost, and you end up making a huge number of copies of just the uh, DNA that's in between, and at this point you can uh, clone in a bacterium and sequence the nucleotides along this region. Then you can go back later and find the remainder of the, of the gene. When we did this, we found that, now, this is a, a picture of the complete nucleotide sequence of the telomerase RNA from tetrahymena, as determined in the Blackburn Laboratory, and from uh, oxytrica and euplodes, and another set of, uh, another uh, genus of ciliates called stylonychia that uh, were determined in our laboratory. I know you can't read from where you're sitting the individual uh, A's, G's, C's, and U's that make up these sequences. But if you could see them, you'd see that there's almost no correspondence from one to the next. These have completely different RNA sequences, except that in the template region, they all have, which is uh, highlighted by this dark bar, they all have the C's and A's that are needed to specify the blocks of G's and T's at the end of the chromosome. However, the 
folding of the RNA is very similar in all cases. Even though the nucleotides are different, they pair with each other in a way that forms a molecule with a long handle coming out here, a helical region here, and a complex structure uh, in this portion where there's one RNA strand paired with itself, and then its loop can bend back and pair with another adjacent portion of the RNA sequence. That particular kind of structure is called a pseudo-knot by people who work on RNA structure. It's not a real knot. It would be a real knot if you passed the RNA chain through the eye of the needle. Instead, if you just lay it down on the outside, it's called a pseudo-knot. So these, this is an example of different RNA molecules that f perform the same function in different cells. They have the same structure, more or less, or at least a highly conserved structure, but they attain that structure through a very different sequence of A's, G's, and C's and U's. So that, for example, in this stem number one, where there's a GC base pair in the middle of it in tetrahymena, there may be a uh, a U base pair or a, or a flipped over CG base pair uh, in one of the other organisms. So you can make a structure using different combinations of the four building blocks. I'd like to now turn to what I promised you I would get to, uh, um, the cell biology area. Can we ask the question, where are these, mo where are these molecules located in the cell? So I'll remind you that we have two different components that we want to, that we might be interested in localizing. One is the telomere binding protein that caps off the end of the DNA and stabilizes it. The other is this enzyme that contains RNA, telomerase, which recognizes the DNA and extends it, thereby solving the shrinking chromosome problem and achieving complete copying of the genetic material. So let's start out with the end binding protein. How would we localize a specific protein in a cell? And the answer is that uh, we can use an antibody that is specific to recognizing the protein of interest. It, you can use the protein of interest as an antigen and raise antibodies as in an experimental way, much as our bodies naturally raise antibodies against uh, antigens such as viral antigens which we encounter in our everyday life. And those antibodies shown here in red can then be very specific reagents to recognize a protein of interest instead of the, all of the other diverse proteins that would be present in a cell. Well, once we've tagged the protein of interest with an antibody that still doesn't enable us to see it because antibodies are very small molecules, so how are we going to find it? You can take another antibody which will recognize any rabbit antibody and this secondary antibody is tagged chemically with a fluorescent group so that when it's excited with the right wavelength of light it glows a particular color. So then by this indirect immunofluorescence technique, one can have this antibody recognizing the protein of interest, this tagged antibody recognizing the antibody, and indirectly light up the location of the protein of interest. We've done this with antibodies uh, directed against the alpha subunit of the telomere protein, and you can see that uh, looks like the entire nucleus of oxytrica is filled up with that telomere binding protein. Well, that's pretty reasonable. If we've got 48 million copies of something in a nucleus, chances are it's going to have to be pretty much filling up the whole nucleus in order to crowd that many in. If we compare the distribution of the end binding protein with just the distribution of the DNA, and we do this in a very similar way, but we use an anti 